Hi, my name is Sarah Shwirip, a trainee in Obzengaini in Malta, and this is my final video on abnormal uterine bleeding. So in my previous videos, we've taken a look at HMB, IMB, PCB, PMB, and now we're going to talk about amenorrhea. Okay, so amenorrhea essentially refers to the absence of menstruation, that is, no periods. We've got physiological amenorrhea, therefore, which is perfectly normal. And this occurs in young girls, during pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and in the menopause. So it is normal not to see any periods during these stages of life. Then we have primary amenorrhea. And this occurs either when there are no periods by the age of 16 with the presence of secondary sexual characteristics, or if there are no periods by the age of 14 with no secondary sexual characteristics. And I'm going to explain the secondary sexual characteristics in just a second. Then we have secondary amenorrhea. And essentially this refers to the absence of periods for at least six months with previous normal menstruation. Good. So before we get into this, we first need to ask a few questions. So we need to know how normal periods occur and where do normal periods start. Okay, so it is vital to know the normal menstrual cycle before getting into this topic. So you can refer to my video on the menstrual cycle, which I shall be linking below. Next, normal periods start during puberty. So basically, puberty begins when the HPO axis wakes up. The HPO axis refers to the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, which we're going to be referring to multiple times in this video. When the HPO axis wakes up, it will wake up the ovaries to start producing estrogen, which sets off puberty. So first, we've got the development of the breasts, which we call thelarchy, and occurs at around 9 to 11 years. Then, pubic hair starts to grow, which is referred to as adrenarchy, occurring at around 11 to 12 years. And finally, periods start at menarchy, which occurs on average at 13 years of age. Good. Now, another thing we need to understand well is the basis of this HPO axis. So over here, we can see the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary gland, and the ovaries. And like we said, this process is kicked off during puberty. It starts off with the hypothalamus producing gonadotrophin-releasing hormone. GnRH will stimulate the anterior pituitary to secrete follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. FSH will stimulate the ovaries to secrete estrogen and progesterone. Then the ovarian hormones have a negative feedback effect on both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, decreasing the release of GnRH, FSH and LH. Good, so we're going to be referring to the HPO axis multiple times to better understand the causes of amenorrhea. So let's get into them. So what are the causes of amenorrhea? So to make this simpler, we can divide them according to the organs in the body. So essentially, we're talking about causes relating to the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the adrenal glands, the ovaries, and outflow tract problems or uterine problems. So starting off with the hypothalamic causes. And here I'm going to be dividing the causes into those that cause primary amenorrhea and those that cause secondary amenorrhea. So just as a recap, let's go back to the HPO axis. So the hypothalamus is involved in secreting GnRH in our HPO axis. So essentially all the causes we're going to mention here, the hypothalamic causes, are disrupting GnRH production. Okay, so let's look at the causes of low GnRH. So we've got anorexia nervosa, excessive exercise, and stress, which can cause both primary and secondary amenorrhea. Why? Because essentially they result in hypothalamic hypogonadism, therefore low GnRH levels. Next, we've got Kalman syndrome. This is a rare condition where there are no GnRH neurons present from birth. So again, we have no GnRH being produced. These patients typically have no sense of smell, which is called anosmia. Then we've got constitutional delay. So typically the mothers of these girls would also have had delayed puberty, they may be short, and may also have had delayed secondary sexual characteristics too. Then other rare causes of secondary menorrhea here are infections such as TB and some tumors. 
Great. So next we're going to discuss the causes related to the anterior pituitary. So over here we've got hyperprolactinemia, which can cause both primary and secondary amenorrhea. So let's go back to the HPO axis to understand why. So GNRH also stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to secrete another hormone called prolactin. This is the hormone which allows breasts to produce milk. Prolactin has a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus, decreasing the release of GNRH. So, therefore, high levels of prolactin will disturb menstruation. Good, now these hyperlactin levels may occur secondary to a pituitary tumor or pituitary hyperplasia. Okay, so then we've got some rare causes here. So we've got empty cella syndrome, where essentially the pituitary gland shrinks, resulting in hypopituitarism. We've got Chihan syndrome. This is when infarction of the pituitary occurs, secondary to postpartum hemorrhage and shock. So again, resulting in hypopituitarism. Good, so next up we've got thyroid disorders resulting in amenorrhea. Essentially over here, both hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism can cause both primary and secondary amenorrhea. And again, we're going to refer back to the HPO axis to understand how. So let's start off with hypothyroidism. So here we have low levels of T3 and T4. This stimulates the hypothalamus to secrete tyrothropin-releasing hormone, TRH, which in turn stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to secrete thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH. Now, TRH also stimulates prolactin release from the pituitary. And as we said before, prolactin inhibits GnRH release, which leads to decreased FSH levels and therefore reduced estrogen, and therefore amenorrhea. Now, in hyperthyroidism, where we have high levels of T3 and T4, these high levels of thyroid hormones trigger the release of sex hormone binding globulin from the liver. SHBG binds with circulating estrogen, therefore reducing the levels of free estrogen, and hence causing amenorrhea. Good. So next, we've got the adrenal causes. So here we have Cushing syndrome, causing both primary and secondary amenorrhea, as well as androgen-secreting tumors. Both these conditions are characterized by high levels of cortisol. So back we go to the HPO axis. So high levels of cortisol inhibit the release of GnRH from the hypothalamus, and therefore this results eventually in low levels of estrogen. Next, we've got congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which can result in primary amenorrhea. This is an autosomal recessive condition resulting in 21 hydroxylase deficiency. This is an enzyme involved in the steroid synthesis pathway, involving the production of sex steroids. Therefore, low levels of sex steroids results in amenorrhea. Great. So now we're going to move on to the ovarian causes. So first on the list over here causing primary amenorrhea, we've got Turner syndrome. And this is the most common cause of primary amenorrhea. So let's talk a bit about this. So essentially, Turner syndrome occurs when instead of having the usual XX or XY sex chromosomes, here we have a single X chromosome. So most of these patients will have a karyotype of 45 XO. In these patients, the ovaries are replaced by functionless fibrous tissue. And this is because the missing X chromosome results in accelerated follicle depletion. So by two years old, no follicles are left, resulting in amenorrhea. These patients also have some characteristic physical features, and some can be seen on the following picture. So we've got short stature, a low hairline, characteristic facial features, a webbed neck. They are at higher risk of aortic coarctation, and they will have poor breast development. They typically have a shield-shaped thorax and widely spaced nipples. They have an elbow deformity, known as cubitus valgus. Like we said, they have rudimentary ovaries. They have these typical nevi, which are brown spots on their skin. And of course, they have no menstruation. 
So next on our list, we have PCOS, which is the most common cause of secondary amenorrhea now. So PCOS refers to polycystic ovarian syndrome. And most of these patients will have polycystic ovaries. So multiple cysts present on their ovaries, however, not necessarily. So to diagnose someone with polycystic ovarian syndrome, we take a look at the Rotterdam criteria, where the patient must have two out of the three characteristics listed below. So one, polycystic ovaries are identified on ultrasound. Two, the patient has irregular periods. And three, the patient has hirsutism, which essentially refers to excessive growth of thick coarse hair in a male-like pattern. So the patient need not necessarily have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, but you might have the other two features and still have PCOS. Essentially in this condition, they have very high levels of LH in comparison to the levels of FSH. They also have high levels of androstenedione, which results in the hirsutism. Later on, I'll be creating a video solely on PCOS, so I'll go more into detail then of why this all happens. I'll just go over the classical presenting symptoms. So they present with hair loss, hirsutism, like we said, weight gain, acne, irregular periods, and pelvic pain. Good. So another ovarian cause of secondary menorrhea is premature ovarian failure. And in a nutshell, this is when the ovaries stop working before 40 years of age. And essentially, the patient goes into menopause. Okay, so lastly now, we have outflow obstruction causes of amenorrhea. So looking at the causes of primary amenorrhea first, we have an imperforate hymen. So essentially here the hymen is covering the entire opening of the vagina and blood from menses collects above it. These patients can develop a hematocolpos, which is basically an accumulation of blood in the vagina. Treatment simply involves a small cut to open the hymen and allow drainage of menses. Next, we've got a transverse vaginal septum, where you have a wall of tissue running horizontally across the vagina, again blocking blood from menses to drain out of the vagina, again requiring a small surgery to help drainage. Then a rare cause is Mullerian agenesis, which is also referred to as Rokitansky syndrome. Basically here the patients have no female organs, as the malarian duct does not develop, and therefore they never get a period. Now, causes of secondary amenorrhea include Asherman syndrome. This is a rare condition where there is a lot of scarring and adhesions within the uterine cavity, secondary to excessive postpartum curettage during, for example, an ERPC. This may cause the walls of the uterus to stick together, causing amenorrhea. Finally, we've got cervical stenosis. This time the cervix is closed, again secondary to repeated procedures on the cervix, trauma or repeated infections, causing secondary amenorrhea. Okay, so that is an overview of the main causes of amenorrhea. Now, how would we approach such a case? So basically, you of course, need to take a thorough history. We need to assess if this is primary or secondary amenorrhea. We also need to assess the patient's secondary sexual characteristics. A full examination is also required with an abdo exam and a vaginal exam, as well as height and weight to obtain a BMI. Then we can take some investigation. So of course, ideally these are focused depending on what you are suspecting from your assessment. But investigations would include a hormone profile containing estrogen, progesterone, FSH, LH, prolactin, testosterone, and TFTs. Next, we can do some imaging, which might include a pelvic ultrasound or MRI and a CT or MRI of the brain to exclude any brain lesions. In some cases, we might also consider performing some genetic tests. After the cause is identified, the appropriate treatment is given to the patient on that particular cause. I really hope that this video was helpful and that the causes of amenorrhea are more systematically organized in your brain. Thank you.